Afternoon, I'm John Diekman, Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Scripps Research Institute. Wanted to welcome all of you and thank you for attending the inaugural John C. Martin Memorial Lectureship. Uh, whether you're attending virtually or in person, it's just a wonderful agenda we have today. This lectureship is endowed, and I would like to thank all of the members of the Scripps Board of Trustees who generously uh, made that possible. I mention it's endowed because uh, we'll be able to do it again, uh, um, probably on an annual basis, but I think when you see uh, the excitement of what's being said today, you'll want to hear this a number of times. And of course, uh, what to expect today, much of the conversation will be about, or all of it, uh, areas that were incredibly important to John and uh, areas that reflect a lot of what he's done uh, for our industry or for healthcare, and particularly infectious diseases. As you can see from your program, John is a scientist, a chemist by training, loved to talk science, was loved to be around places like Scripps where he could do that. Uh, but he also became one of the true leaders in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, when he and his team, uh, I don't want to say took over, whatever the word is, became the leadership at Gilead Sciences, the company really blossomed into one of the major players in the industry, and particularly in the areas that are important to human health, infectious disease, antivirals, but really as a new company, you know, it's not 200 years old like many of these pharma companies, as a new company has made an incredible contribution to the pharmaceutical industry. So what I wanna just highlight today is the agenda uh, we have four speakers. Dr. Rich Whitley will talk. He's an uh, infectious disease expert. You can read about all this. He'll talk about just that topic. Uh, Dr. Norbert Bischoff Berger will talk about some of the early research, antiviral research at Gilly, but also something going on in his own life now. Pete Schultz, whom I hope people here know who he is, is going to talk about science. And then we'll have a wrap up from Dr. Lillian Liu, Lillian Liu, who is John's longtime partner and a member of the Board of Trustees of Scripps. Uh, before I turn the podium over, I can't help but say, go off script and say um, how special it's been to work with John on our board at Scripps. He's made amazing contributions. He's a gifted listener. And uh, on our board, that is really respected because the gifted listeners, listeners normally have really astute contributions to make after listening to debates and policy discussions. He was very, very special in moving scripts forward and had plans to move it even further forward. Uh, because of that, it's today's a bittersweet opportunity, but I think you'll very much enjoy what you hear about John and what you hear about the pathway he set human health on. So I'm gonna stop there, uh, turn the podium over to Dr. Jamie Williamson, who's the Chief Academic Officer of Scripps, and Jamie will be introducing each of the speakers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you. Uh, we have three notable speakers today. We're gonna do this in two sections. We'll have two speakers and then we'll adjourn for a 30 minute break and then we'll hear from Pete and lastly, we'll hear uh, some remarks from Lily. Uh, so let me uh, introduce the first speaker, Dr. Richard Whitley is from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He has many positions there. He's Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics, Professor of Microbiology, Medicine, and Neurosurgery. He's the co-director of the Division of Pediatric and Infectious Diseases and Vice Chair of the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, he has a nationally prominent role as a physician serving as the NIH NIAD, NIAD 
COVID-19 Data Safety Monitoring Board. So that's really current. Uh, throughout his career, Richard has made significant contributions to virology and development of antiviral therapies. His connection to John Martin began in the 80s when they collaborated on ganciclovir, which is an antiviral used to treat cytomegalovirus infections. Ultimately, he served on the board of uh, Gilead scientists, scientists for a number of years. Uh, Richard is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including most recently the 2022 Howland Award from the American Pediatric Society in recognition of his contributions to advancing child health and the profession of pediatrics. So please join me in welcoming Richard Whitley. I want to just reiterate a, a word that John used a minute ago, and that is, this is certainly bittersweet for me. I mean, John was my best friend, and um, I would ha prefer to have him here so that we could talk about his work together. I'm not going to talk just about the science that John brought to the table, but his contributions to all of us as friends. And I want to emphasize that because that was as much a part of John as anything. Now, this is going to be a strange talk for a lot of you. Many of you just do basic science. You don't understand the flip side of the coin. Doug Richmond does. I mean, he did it for his entire career. And that is, what do you do with a molecule once you have the molecule? How do you take it from that molecule through the development phase of giving it to people and ultimately proving the value of a compound and getting it licensed by the Food and Drug Administration? So I'm really going to focus on the latter. I'm not going to talk too much about the chemistry. So my first encounter with John. Let's go back to the mid-1980s. I met John at Syntex, and it was in the context of me trying to persuade him to study the drug he synthesized at Syntex, and that's gancyclovir. Well, was I crazy or simply an aggressive associate professor, given the fact that this drug is mutagenic, teratogenic, and carcinogenic? Just pause. Who would give a drug with those properties to children at the risk of toxicity? Well, that's it. It's a risk-benefit ratio. And John immediately understood the potential benefit of this drug as opposed to the risk. And I think that's important to keep in mind as we go through this discussion. John was a medicinal chemist who basically did a postdoc in the laboratory of John Freed at Syntex. I guess what's important to remember is when he synthesized gancyclovir, nobody at Syntex wanted him to do that. This was not on his list of things to do. But John took it upon himself to do that and did it uh, with real style. And I just show you the first lab that John worked in, and you'll note that it was in no way, shape, or form earthquake proof. So, okay, what are we going to try and talk about here? Well, DHPG, the drug on the far left, dihydroxypropoxyguanine is gancyclovir. It's the last time you're going to hear me talk about DHPG. I'm only going to make reference to it in terms of gancyclovir. So here it is, the mid-1980s, and it was time to uh, begin to think about how we could expand the use of this drug. Originally, it was used by people like Doug in treating CMV retinitis in HIV-infected individuals. But the drug had significant activity against CMV in other infections of human beings. And one of those is a disease called congenital cytomegalovirus infection. But when you take a drug into babies, it becomes far more complicated. It's not like taking it into an adult who's got huge veins and you can put them in a, uh, in a clinical research unit and you can take as much blood as you want from them. But we're talking about little babies, babies less than a month of age that weigh maybe four kilograms at the absolute most. And to begin the work, one had to do pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies to understand how best to administer the drug to people, and in particular to babies, because they're going to behave differently than adults. And so the very first studies we did, you'll notice, weren't published until 1993, whereas the study of gancyclovir in HIV-infected individuals was known since 1983. Okay, so where did we take it? What is congenital cytomegalovirus infection, and why is it important? Well, this is the disease. When we see children who have a small head, 
known as microcephaly, petechial rash or a perforic rash with hepatosplenomegaly, the first disease we think of now that we have a vaccine to prevent rubella, is congenital cytomegalovirus infection. To put it in perspective for you, this is the most common congenital infection in the developed world today. It was important for me to develop a drug to treat this infection because of the devastation I saw as a pediatrician in children and their families who had this disease. So to give you some sense as to the epidemiology of the infection, if you just look at this uh, flow sheet, Primary maternal CMV infection occurs in about three to three and a half percent of all women in this country. Where do they get it? They get it from an older child at home who's been in daycare, who gets infected in daycare and then brings it home, sneezes in mom's face. Mom becomes infect infected during her pregnancy, and it leads to transmission of the virus in utero to the fetus. Well, when that happens, 40% of the fetuses that are infected, or 40% of the mothers, will transmit infection to the fetus. And if you look on the left-hand side, 10 to 15% of those babies will have symptomatic disease just like the one I showed you a minute ago. And that's in, including microcephaly and a uh, petechial rash. Of those children, less than 10% will develop normally. Sergio Stagno and I, when we wrote this paper, said 10% because we didn't have long-term follow-up on these children. But I'm sure today, if we followed those children, none of them would be normal and none of them would have a developmental profile that's acceptable. So we're saying most of them are going to have developmental sequelae. If you look at the right-hand side, you'll see 85 to 90% are asymptomatic. But of that group, we know that a percentage of them, at least 10 to 15%, are gonna go on and develop evidence of disease. And that's primarily gonna be hearing loss, which is going to impair their development intellectually. And that becomes a significant problem for them as well as their parents. Now, this is what we see in these children. The central nervous system complications, you'll notice are shown here with intracranial calcifications. And we also note that the ventricles, not that you would necessarily be able to perceive them, as non-clinicians are larger than they should be. But you see the large dark area in the middle of that uh, scan is uh, the ventricles, which are exceedingly large. These children also develop chorioretinitis, the same kind of retinitis we see in HIV-infected individuals in the pre-highly active antiretroviral era. And then we'll also see uh, problems with the dentition, as is evidence in this one child. It's a severe disease and it's an incredible burden, not just for the child, but obviously for the family as well. And when you follow these families long enough, and I've dealt with these children over their entire lifetimes, it's really uh, a problem that needs uh, attention and support for the family. So let's talk a little bit about what we know of babies who are born around the world with congenital CMV. There's a direct relationship to maternal seropositivity, the column on the right, and the percentage of children or the incidence of congenital CMV infection, the middle column. So the more likely it is for mom to be seropositive, the percentage of children who have congenital CMV infection is increased. In the United States today, when Sergio and I were doing the original epidemiologic studies, about 1% of all children were infected with this virus. Today, it's down around 0.8%. In some areas of the country, it's about 0.7%. But it's still very high, and you'll see the implications for that in a minute. So what do we see in these children? Well, first of all, about a third of them will be born prematurely. As background, in the United States, the incidence of prematurity is about 20%. So it's about 50% higher than we would expect it to be under normal circumstances. Small, small for gestational age, 50% of the babies. Again, what does that mean? That's about uh, twice uh, as high as it should be for other births in the United States. And then reticuloendothelial involvement includes the rash that I showed you on that one baby, evidence of being yellow or jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, large liver, large spleen, and evidence of purpura, which is a good bruise that we see in ourselves sometimes when we undergo those experiences. Now, the problem is we see neurologic, neurologic complications in these children. 
about 70% of them will have at least one neurologic problem, including microcephaly, lethargy, hypotonia, poor suck, and seizures. And if you just take microcephaly, over half of the children will have a small head circumference, which will impair their subsequent growth and development. Okay, we also see laboratory abnormalities, elevated liver function tests, that's what ALT stands for, low platelets, less than 50,000. They should be greater than 150,000. Elevated bilirubin, which goes along with jaundice, we see frequently in these children. And these are findings that don't go away quickly. You'll find laboratory abnormalities in these children that can last for four, six, even eight weeks. And it's to our advantage to get these laboratory values normalized so we don't have bleeding problems in the children who are infected. Now, the most common problem that we encounter in these children is hearing impairment. And it can be sensorineural hearing loss. It can be bilateral hearing loss. And you can see that in the top two lines, about 60% in the symptomatic group will have hearing loss compared to about 7.5% in the asymptomatic group. Bilateral hearing loss, about a third of the babies. And we can go on to look at the impact on the speech threshold for these children being about a quarter in the symptomatic group and about 2% in the asymptomatic group. But a telling line is an IQ less than 70, and that'll happen in at least a fifth of the children who are symptomatic and about 25 to 3% in the asymptomatic group. And we'll come back to the meaning of those numbers in just a minute. So what do we know about hearing loss? First of all, in congenital CMV, it can be present at birth or it can be delayed. And what I mean by that is some of these children won't develop evidence of hearing loss until they're a year or two years of age. And the only time we pick it up is when these children fail in school. So now what we do if we know a baby is congenitally infected, even if the child is asymptomatic, we put the child into a follow-up program where we do audiologic brainstem responses in these children every six months to make sure that their hearing is normal, and if not, intervene, either with hearing aids or with uh, artificial tympanic membranes. So there's certainly variability in the severity of hearing loss, and we know that there can be unilateral high-frequency loss to profound bilateral loss. And certainly there can be progressive hearing loss over time in these children. And you, needless to say, these uh, children will have impaired learning capability if they can't hear. Now, this is an important slide, because if we look at the sequelae following primary infection of mother versus recurrent infection of mother, hearing loss is far more common with primary infection of mom than it is with recurrent infection of mom. Why is it important? Well, a lot of the data that I'm showing you today came from an Institute of Medicine report that a couple of my colleagues and I did for the National Academy of Medicine. And the goal of it was to identify vaccine priorities for the United States. And the conclusion of that report is congenital CMV is a target for developing a vaccine to administer to moms to prevent transplacental transmission of virus. So when you see disease following recurrent maternal infection, it means that even though these moms have pre-existing solid antibodies, they can still lead to a second infection in another child, meaning that the development of a vaccine is going to be exceedingly difficult. And if we look at vaccines for herpes virus infections, we've really only, in humans that is, we've only succeeded in developing one, and that's for shingles and chickenpox. Okay, so if we look at the grand scheme of things and take a birth rate in the United States of about 4 million and assuming an infection rate, which is about 1%, and it does vary in certain areas of the country, that means about 40,000 infants will be infected annually in this country. With 40,000 infected annually, there will be about 2,800 uh, who are, end up having symptomatic disease, there will be about 300 who end up with fatal disease, and then there will be significant sequelae in those who are survivors, and the number of infants with asymptomatic infection at birth, but who will go on to develop sequelae, is about 5,500 children, accounting for 
severe sequelae or a fatal outcome in about 8,000 children annually. So in the United States today, many states have implemented a universal CMV screening program. In other words, when every baby is born, two things have to happen. They have to have their hearing checked and they have to have their urine assessed for excretion of CMV. And if the hearing is not optimal, or if there's evidence of CMV in the urine, these children immediately go into a follow-up hearing evaluation program. And I'll come back to one of the unresolved questions in just a minute. Now, I'm gonna come back to the drug that we started with, and that's gancyclovir, and what we did with it, and how we did it, and why we did it, and how we reached some of the conclusions that we've reached. Now, this is a phase two study. It was done in, in, in children who had symptomatic disease, and we gave them one of two doses of gancyclovir, either eight milligrams per kilogram or 12 milligrams per kilogram. Now remember, this drug is not orally bioavailable, so it has to be given intravenously. So we did this for a period of six weeks, and that becomes important when we talk about clinical trial design. And I'll show you what the clinical trial design is on the next slide. But there are two points that I want to make, and that is, if you just look at the magenta line, you can see that the viral load as monitored in the urine of these babies decreased, but it never went down to undetectable. The best we could do is get it down to about one log of virus in the urine following six weeks of intravenous gancyclovir therapy. And then when we discontinued therapy, you could see that there was a rebound in viral load. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we've developed a resistant virus? Or does that mean we haven't treated these babies long enough? And so we did test those isolates from, from the children who had a rebound in their virus excretion, and none of those viruses were resistant, but it does beg the question about duration of therapy. But just think, you can't give a baby that weighs three or four kilograms gancyclovir intravenously forever particularly with its toxicity profile. Now, here is the clinical trial design. So we identified children who had congenital infection by culture, and they had to have central nervous system involvement. And we demanded central nervous system involvement because we didn't want to expose, for example, children who were asymptomatic, who we didn't know whether they were gonna go on and develop sequelae or not, to this potentially toxic medication. After informed consent, the baby was randomized to either intravenous gancyclovir or no treatment. And you would say, well, no placebo. No, no placebo. We couldn't justify putting an IV into babies to give them saline for six weeks. And instead, we simply followed those children in the same rigorous fashion as we did the children who received IV gancyclovir. The saving grace is the audiologist who performed the brainstem evoked responses, which was our endpoint for the clinical trial, did not know the randomization that the baby received, whether it be placebo or drug. And then the monitoring was clinical, serologic, and toxicity. We had escape clauses for toxicity. And then we followed these children through five years. And now we're following them through 20 years. And the reason is we wanna make sure there's no evidence of carcinogenicity that could appear late in life. Our numbers are small, so it's unlikely that we'll find evidence of that, but clearly we're trying to follow them as best we possibly can. So the primary endpoint, improved brainstem evoked response by one gradation or maintaining normal hearing. And you'll remember a lot of the children with normal hearing at baseline will deteriorate and develop hearing impairment. And there are two ways to measure response. One is a biologic response, all ears that are evaluated, and the other is a functional assessment, and you take the best year of a child, and then you see what happens with uh, hearing in that one particular uh, year. Now, there are other endpoints that were important. Resolution of the platelet count. We want to avoid the problem of potential bleeding. Elevation of white blood count. We wanted to avoid the potential for complications of infection. Normalization of liver function tests. And then clinical improvement by resolution of hepatosplenomegaly and resolution of retinitis. I'm not gonna show you data on these secondary endpoints, but I can tell you we rapidly corrected platelet count, white count, and normalizing bilirubin. But resolving hepatosplenomegaly, that's a different story. 
We weren't even able to resolve it in as long as six weeks of treatment in the first clinical trial we did. So tertiary endpoint rate of growth, quaternary endpoint decreased mortality. We didn't expect significant mortality, but we certainly had to monitor it. And this is what we learned. This is hearing at one year. And remember, we only treated these babies for six weeks. The, the pie chart on the left is again, cyclovir recipients. The pie chart on the right is the no treatment group. Red is bad, green is good. You can see that the children who received no treatment had deterioration in their hearing significantly greater than those who received treatment as illustrated by the pie chart on the left. And it wasn't just hearing, it was decibel response as well. So the children on the left could hear better than the children on the right. Okay, but it still begs the question is, how long is long enough? In addition, we noticed that we had to adjust dosages, stop treatment and restart it, or permanently discontinue it because of toxicity in these children. Illustrating at least to me that perhaps we needed to find a, not only a better drug, but a better way to administer the drug that we are currently studying. So we also did Denver developmental evaluations on these children. We did them at six weeks, six months, and 12 months. Um, and and uh, we looked at developmental delay in these children. And for those of you who are aficionados of developmental tests, I'd be the first to admit that Denver developmental tests are horrible. It was the best we had at the time, and I'll, choose, I'll show you the tools that we used in the more contemporary studies. Now, these are Sarah Oliver's data, and I bring her up because she's running the COVID vaccine program at the Centers for Disease Control at the present time. And if we look at the average number of delays in the treatment group versus the no treatment group, you can see that there are significant differences between the two. But what's important to keep in mind, these are all delays for all children. When we eliminate, um, and this is the Kaplan-Meier survival plot for it, showing that with time, the delays increased in the no treatment group compared to the gancyclovir treatment group. Now, when we eliminate delays without language, the numbers are equally impressive, whereby we can show that um, at 12 months, there are statistically significant difference in delays between the two treatment groups. So what's the next step? Well, the next step was, can we use Valgan cyclovir? And let's go back to John. You know, at this point, John had left Syntex. He left being a frontline medicinal chemist, but he was involved in designing the experiments that led to Valgan cyclovir being synthesized and ultimately made available for these children as well as for the adult populations who had CMV retinitis. And it's been certainly a, a salvation to all of us to have an orally bioavailable drug to treat CMV infections. So this is the prodrug of gancyclovir. The ester is metabolized to gancyclovir in the blood, and we can achieve plasma levels that are important. But we needed to go back and repeat the PK and PD data so we know how so that we could learn how to administer the drug. And here, it's very interesting. What we learned is if you look at the blue bars, you'll see that the peak plasma com concentration on day six was about three and a half milligrams per liter. And if you look at the concentration on day 35, it was two milligrams per liter. Why? Well, for one reason, and that is we went back and looked at all of our data and we realized that the maturation of the newborn kidney led to increased clearance, which meant that we needed to adjust the dosage of Valgian cyclovir with time. And when we do adjust the dosage, we can return the levels to what we would expect them to be in a normal treatment course. But there's one other lesson we learned. And if you look at the um, chart on the left, it's the median IV concentration versus the chart on the right, which is the median PO concentration. And we learned very quickly that peak plasma concentration occurred much more rapidly in those babies who got drug IV compared to those who got drug PO. And it certainly influenced the toxicity profile that we encountered in the children who got Valgan cyclovir. And that becomes exceedingly important because now all of those treatment adjust adjustments and the problems that we had giving Gan cyclovir we avoided with Valgan cyclovir. Now we did a different kind of study. 
And it goes back to the question, did we treat those babies long enough? So we gave all babies oral valgancyclovir, and they were given oral valgancyclovir for a period of six weeks. And then they were randomized to oral valgancyclovir or a matching placebo to complete six months of therapy. And along the way, toxicity was monitored, viral load was monitored, uh, brainstem evoked responses were monitored, and then these children were followed post-treatment and their hearing assessed. And what we learned was significant. First of all, six weeks of treatment is on the left, six months of treatment is on the right. And you can see that there's no real difference between the two. And that's because all babies got six weeks of treatment. So you wouldn't expect a big change at that point in time. But where we really see a change is when we continue to follow these children out with time. Six months of treatment shown on the right, those children had continued improvement in their hearing at 12 months, whereas there was deterioration in hearing shown in the red in the pie chart on the left. And this is all years in the children uh, who were evaluated. So, I mean, this is a good start, but there were other things that we had to learn. The next question is, how long did this persist? And when we looked at the 24-month data, we saw that there was a persistence of hearing improvement in the babies who got six months of treatment compared to six weeks of treatment. Okay, the next thing we did was, rather than do Denver developmental evaluations, we did barely developmental scales in these children. And I only show this slide to remind you, we'd love to have IQs of around 90 to 109 in these children, but we'd also accept 80 to 89 because most of the ones that we'd evaluated historically were well below uh, 70. And what we learned in this study was very, very important. If you look at Denver developmental evaluations, they mean nothing compared to Bailey evaluations. Using a bon Viore regression analysis, we were able to show that the language composite benefited significantly compared to other outcome events. And yes, there are other p-values that are significant, but the one that really counts is the impact of six months of valgancyclovir on hearing and language composite. So with language composite improving, it means these children can learn if we can provide them the resources to do so. Again, if we look at outcome in terms of uh, average versus borderline, you can see six months of therapy, average co cognitive performance, language performance, and motor compositive, composite compared to borderline for six weeks of treatment with appropriate p-values re reflecting the outcome. Well, one of the things that we do as virologists is we look at viral load. And we can see that in both groups over the first 42 days, six weeks of treatment, viral load went down the same in both treatment groups as you would expect it to. And then in the babies who were switched to placebo, the viral load increased. And with an increase in viral load, um, we found significant changes. But again, when those isolates were looked at to determine whether there was evidence of resistance, we could find none. Viral load stayed low in the children who received or valgancyclovir for six months. But again, there was a blip at the end of treatment. And as we follow those children, they still excrete virus at low level, but they don't totally clear it, which means there's the potential for them to have immune complex disease that's going to impair their hearing down the road. So what do we learn from viral load analyses? First, a higher whole blood viral load with CNS involvement at baseline was higher than it was for those children who did not have central nervous system involvement. And a higher viral load at baseline was associated with poor cognitive composite and fine motor performance in their neurodevelopmental outcomes. But we couldn't find a correlation between viral load area under the curve and neurodevelopment, and the rate of viral clearance did not influence outcome events. So what did we conclude? Well, we concluded that six months of oral valgancyclovir is superior to six weeks of therapy. We knew that neutropenia didn't occur, and it's because of the, the, the lack of a peak plasma level of gancyclovir that we saw with IV therapy. And at the present time, the American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending um, 16 milligrams per kilogram twice a day of valgancyclovir for a period of six months. But there are unanswered questions. 
And the first of all is, will Valgan and Cyclovir therapy reverse late onset hearing loss? And what we're doing is the children who've been identified that have hearing loss later in life, we've gone back and gotten their blood spots from the time they were born, eluded DNA to determine whether or not we can detect CMV DNA in its presence. And if so, we randomized those children and have done the study to either Valgan, Cyclovir, or placebo. And those data are being analyzed at the same time. What we don't know is if therapy will uh, help the asymptomatically infected child in order to prevent hearing loss? And lastly, will there be an opportunity for combination therapy? And I'll make one political statement here, and that is, if uh, John were here today, he would be synthesizing new drugs to treat CMV infections, including congenital CMV. And in fact, he and I were talking about that just before he died. But there's no pharmaceutical industry today who's going to develop a drug to treat either CMV or especially congenital CMV. And I'm going to leave you with one slide of my friend and his son, John. And this is uh, on a barrier island off the coast of Georgia known as Little Cumberland Island. It's a very special place, and it's a place John liked to go. But I'll tell you one story about John, which epitomizes John Martin as a person. And that is, I was out weed whacking one day with my son, Chris. And all of a sudden, John shows up in blue jeans and an old shirt, and he had... Uh, he had earplugs in his ears, and he goes, give me that thing. I want a weed whack. And the next thing I know, John's out there whacking weeds with Chris, and the two of them are cutting him down. And that was one trip. And then the next trip, here Chris is painting the deck and staining it. John's out there right beside him painting the deck. And I know of no other individual uh, who would be doing that, especially the CEO of a company. And that was John Martin. <coughs> now, I just want to conclude with two other pictures. One is um, I had the privilege of following John around the world with Lori and Lily as we celebrated John's accomplishments, one of which was receiving an honorary degree from the University of Leuven. But that was just one occasion. And the other was about three, four months ago, Dan O'Day did create uh, a memory of John on the second floor of the main building at Gilead Sciences and John's name. <coughs> A couple of us wanted uh, a building name for John, and we'll, we're still working on that. And lastly, you know, what's so important is the studies that I'm talking about are team sports. They're not done by any one individual. They're done by a group of people. So, you know, if you don't have patients and families who are willing to have their children participate in this, their studies, such as these, you're not going to get any place. Uh, my colleague David Kimberlin has been crucial in this. My colleagues in the ID division are crucial. Certainly NIAD has played a role, and the Collaborative Antiviral Study Group staff members are important. Um, UAB Biostatistics did a masterful job in analyzing these data for us. And then Kath Kathy Laughlin and Walla Dempsey uh, are unbelievable as project officers at the NIH. We see so many bad things about the people at the NIH, but I can't say enough good things about these people. And all I can say is I only wish John was here today because he would be celebrating the accomplishment of from bench to bedside to licensure of this drug to treat babies with congenital CMV. Thank you. Sure, sure. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Richard. Uh, we, uh, we do have some time for questions from the audience. Oh, here, here down in front. Rich, when do these uh, these uh, patients, the, the babies, when do they start developing an antibody response? Because uh, that viral load was coming up at six months. When uh, remember, remember one thing, and that is these moms were infected in utero, or the babies were infected in utero. And so moms are giving these babies transplacental maternal antibodies. So we know that those antibodies are going to persist for about six months, depending upon whether the baby was born premature prematurely or a term. But when we look at the kinetics of antibody response, native antibodies in these babies, they'll begin developing antibodies by four to six weeks of life. Yes, great Good question here. Very impressive uh, 25 years of work, uh, especially for the team that sits in the back. If you would present to these guys today 
the clinical problem. Here is the problem. How do we solve it? So with genomic, bioinformatic, AI, uh, would it be 25 years? Would it be two years? Uh, how would you approach it differently today with everything you know? So Ari, there are two parts to your question is, what contemporary technology do we apply to drug discovery? Certainly using artificial intelligence, structural biology is crucial to where we're going in the future. You can't just say, oh, we've got this target and we're gonna take it into high throughput screens and we're gonna screen it against uh, a library of 20 or 50 or 100,000 molecules. That's gonna go no place in the future. We've gotta think out of the box and we've gotta do things better. That's half of the problem. The other half of the problem is, the kind of diseases that I've studied in my life are rare diseases. And there are two parts of this question. Number one is getting families to be willing to participate in a study that's a rare disease. And so recruiting and maintaining these babies in studies is important. The second part of the problem is when you have a drug that's licensed like valgancyclovir to treat retinitis in HIV infected individuals, and this trial is listed at clinicaltrials.gov, the community physician is gonna say, hell, I'm not gonna put this baby on a study, I'm just gonna follow that protocol, clinicaltrials.gov, but I'll treat them on my own. And then they call you and say, well, we don't know how long to treat. How long are you treating? What are you learning? And it's obvious that they don't know. So it begs the question of how do we streamline clinical trials? And I think the designs that we've used for clinical trials historically are wrong. I, th I don't think you can use the classic designs that have been employed. We've gotta use adaptive clinical trials We've got to use expanded phase two studies that lead to licensure immediately within uh, expanded phase three, phase four studies to build the safety and toxicity data following a, a, a tentative EUA approval. But it's not easy, I have to say that, especially for rare diseases. Okay, any other questions? I don't see any hands, so let's, uh, let's thank Richard for a terrific presentation. Thank you. Okay, our, our next speaker is Norbert Bischofberger. Norbert is a chemist by training. He served as the chief scientific officer and executive vice president for research and development at Gilead Biosciences. And in that position, he was instrumental in developing the antiviral medication Tamiflu. He was a core member of the team that grew Gilead from a company with fewer than 50 employees and no revenue to an organization with more than 10,000 employees and $25 billion in annual revenues. During his 28-year career at Gilead, he presided over the development and approval of more than 25 medicines that transformed the treatment of HIV and viral hepatitis. He is currently the president and CEO of Kronos Bio. That's a biotech company focused on modulating transcription factors in cancer. John Martin was very integral in connecting Norbert uh, to Ari Belladragon, who is the board chair at Kronos. And he uh, picked them as a match knowing that they, they would work well together. In addition to his leadership role at Kronos, Norbert serves on the, the supervisory board of Bayer AG and is on the board of directors for Morphic Therapeutics. Please welcome Norbert. Well, thanks, Jamie, for the uh, kind introduction. I would like to start off by thanking the organizers for the kind invitation to speak here at the first memorial lectureship of John Martin. It's both a pleasure, but also an honor for me to be here. So let's start off with the man who are, we, we are here for to remember and to honor, John Martin. John and I started at Gilead pretty much at the same time, three months apart in 1990, and I, he was my boss for 27 years, and I reported to him with a great relationship. As you all know, John Martin and Gilead is mostly known for the work on antivirals, and there was a nice piece that came out in Forbes that uh, highlighted him, and it says the golden age of antiviral drugs. And the first big drug that Gilead was approved was Viriad, one pill, once daily, and that was approved on October 26, 2001. But we then coincidentally both 
came to the conclusion we were going to leave Gilead at the same time for completely different reasons. I wanted to go back more to be closer to the science, work for a small company. John, I think, was tired of being the CEO. He handed over the reins to somebody else. And when John and I talked, he said, I want to come with you. Wherever you go, whatever you do, I'll be with you. And here we are. He was on the Kronos Bio Board, uh, Board of Directors. This was our board meeting about two years ago in New York. And also in this picture is Ari Beldigrun here. He is the, both the co-founder and the chairman of uh, Kronos Bio. And probably some of you may know this person, Owen Witte, very well-known biologist at, uh, at UCLA. And for these reasons, because we were both found a new home in Kronos Bio, that's the reason why I want to talk about what are we doing at Kronos Bio. So who are we? We're a clinical stage uh, cancer company and really focused on transcription and transcriptional regulatory networks and their effect in oncology. With about 100 employees, we're located on both coasts. In San Mateo on the West Coast, we have development, clinical development and corporate, and we have the labs and research discovery and translational in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and on both coasts, we have about 50 employees. So what I would like to cover is two big buckets, two big things. First of all, give you an overview of transcriptional regulate, uh, deregulation in cancer. And secondly, in the second part of my talk, talk about what are we doing about it or what's our approach. And then the first topic, I would like to first convince you that transcription factor deregulation is really a hallmark of all cancers. Number two, what actually do these transcription factors do? And number three, what is our emerging understanding of transcriptional regulatory, uh, transcriptional regul deregulation in cancer? So let's start off with topic number one. I want to convince you that transcription factor deregulation is really a hallmark of almost all cancers. You probably know this uh, uh, compound, or the, the, the target to the left, RAS. You know, RAS is a very well-known oncogene when it's mutated. Uh, particularly, you probably know about the G12C and the G12D mutations that leave RAS in a constant on configuration. But what, and, and RAS, it causes about 20%, is involved in 20% of all tumors. But more important, I would argue, are transcription factors. Shown here are two. P53 is a tumor suppressor gene. That's involved between 25 and 60% of tumors. And the second one is MYC. That's uh, uh, causally involved in tumors to about 20% or more. And the importance of the interplay between the mutations and the transcriptions is really shown here. So this is a very bad lung tumor model. I mean, it's bad for the mice. That's what I'm trying to say. And uh, this is a both a MYC amplified and RAS mutated tumor model. And as you see here, the, uh, the mice die pretty quickly in black. When you have an, an inducible MYC inhibitor, in this case, it's something called OMOMYC. OMOMYC is something that inhibits MYC. And it's inducible with DOCs. You see, with just one cycle of OMOMYC induction, you increase survival. With multiple cycles of OMOMYC induction, you completely prevent uh, mortality. So, and then in addition, histology completely normalizes. And as you see here, this is day zero, the lung epithelium. And at day five, it looks uh, completely, almost completely normal. So this shows you that yes, RAS is a bad oncogene, but uh, if you can deal with the transcription factors that are upregulated, in this case, MYC, you can actually uh, deal with RAS. Now, subsequently, I mean, subsequently, in the, in the recent years, a number of companies, this is work by Novartis, which, which was published in 2017, they has asked, what are the dependencies in, in tumors? So essentially, you knock down in various, they had 400 cell lines, they knocked down various genes and looked for cell viability. And it turns out in many, many of these tumors, the dependencies are actually, again, transcription factors. You're probably familiar, SOX10, 
TP53, IRA4, MIP, RANKS, these are well-known uh, transcription factors. Now, there are about 800 genes in our genome that encode transcription factors. And more than 100 are known to be Im important and involved in cancers. It is a, uh, a little uh, tabulation is shown here. Despite this knowledge, and despite the fact that many of these are involved in tumors, not many have actually been drugged. There are a few notable exceptions. You probably know this one, the two nuclear hormone receptor, uh, androgen receptor and estrogen receptors. There are pretty good drugs available. The, the enzalutamide is one example, fulvestrant is the other. And why is it that these transcription factors in particular were able to be drugged? Well, because there are small molecules that bind to it, steroids. In the case of androgen receptors, it's uh, testosterone or the hydrotestosterone. Of course, in, in the case of the estrogen receptor, it's estrogen. And by the way, fulvestrin for the chemists among you is essentially estrogen with a long fatty acid tail on it. So it's an estrogen degrader. Another interesting success, and I'm saying interesting, I'll tell you why, are the Icaros uh, transcription factors. Uh, they, those are the imids, pomalidomide and lenamidomide. And by the way, there's an interesting book published on the history of, of uh, what was the original one? The, uh, uh, what? Yeah. And, and it, it's called Dark Remedy. I would urge you to. So it started off with this drug was available or approved. It wasn't even clear what it was approved for, morning sickness or to calm people down, but it led to terrible, terrible teratogenicity. Uh, it was never approved in the US. Essentially, babies were born without limbs. That, that was the effect. And then uh, the next thing that happened, this drug, uh, there, there was an HIV-infected person who also had multiple myeloma. And the person was kind of anxious. He couldn't calm down. And the physician thought, well, I'll give him some thalidomide. Maybe it helps. And lo and behold, the multiple melanoma went away. That then led to the approval of these compounds for multiple melanoma. But until very recently, we did not know how these things work. Well, it turns out they degrade these Icarus transcription factors. And the Icarus transcription factors are important in B-cell development, and that's the reason why they work uh, for multiple myeloma. And also, the, the teratogenicity is completely on target because these transcription factors are also important in limb development. Now, uh, fast forward, this is where we are today. There are a number of other transcription factors that are drugged. You probably know PPAR, RARA, the, uh, um, and uh, a number of others are in clinical development. You're probably familiar with the MDM2, P53, P53 pair, YAP, uh, Pete, which has talked about that, STAT5, STAT3, and NUT. So the second question is, what exactly do these transcription factors actually do? That, that's my next one. So by the way, I hope I've convinced you that transcription factor deregulation is really a hallmark of cancers. So what do these things do? Well, there are two possible definitions. One of them is a mechanistic one, and that's very simple. Well, they bind to tight sites in the genome in a context and sequence-specific manner. And once they bind, they recruit additional factors and manage transcription or regulate transcription. There's also a regulatory definition. They integrate multiple signaling cues. They create regulatory networks and then co encode complex behavior to enable spatial and temporal gene regulation. The regulatory definition is shown a little bit in more detail here. So essentially, you get all these signals upstream. They then converge at the level of the transcription, where the transcription factors manage this. That leads to expression of certain genes. There's a heavy post-translational modification. There's an interactome with the... With the uh, genome with the uh, uh, HATs, histone acetyl transferases, and deacetylases. And that leads to various activities, including, as you see there, adhesion, angiogenesis, signaling, oncogenic signaling, growth proliferation, and metabolism. 
But then transcription factors are also involved in development. And you, we all know that a single genome gives rise to multiple cell types. It starts off with a zygote blastocyst, and then it develops to an organism that has hundreds of different cell types. And there are examples of endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm. Uh, and these developmental states are all managed by transcription factors. So transcription factors during de development, they get upregulated, the it, it cell um, um, changes, and then they are supposed to get downregulated again. That's very well known for uh, blood um, cell development. So it starts with a pluripotent embryonic stem cell, then it goes into the myeloid lineage or the lymphoid lineage. The lymphoid goes into B cell, T cells, and the myeloid goes into the various myeloid cells, including uh, uh, macrophages, monocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, etc. And all these states, these transitions and the final differentiated state are managed by transcription factors. Even more interesting, I find this fascinating, we have now learned that if you upregulate certain transcription factors, you can actually convert one cell into another. And, you know, for instance, the best, the first example that was published is this year, where the researchers found if, if you take a fibroblast, upregulate myOD, it turns into a muscle cell. This was interestingly enough published in 1989 by Hal Weintraub, and he was one of the co-founders of Gilead. It's kind of an in incredible coincidence. You know, these, these fibroblasts can also turn into, you know, brown fat cells, neur neuronal cells, cardiomyocytes, again, depending on which transcription factors are upregulated. The best example on this slide is the third from the left. And this is when, when researchers in Japan found that fibroblasts with these four upregulated, these four transcription factors actually turn into a pluripotent stem cell. You probably all know these are called the Yamanaka factors. This was published in 2006, and uh, it is said that he got one of the fastest Nobel Prizes. So six years in 2012, six years after the publication, he got the Nobel Prize. This is truly magnificent work. So I explained to you what transcription factors do. Now let me uh, talk to uh, talk about the, the last piece in this first section about what is our current understanding of dereg transcriptional deregulation and what are these transcriptional regulatory networks and what is tumor identity. And essentially the way you have to see it or the way we interpret this Tumors and cancers are three things. First of all, it's the tissue of origin. Number two, it's the mutation, which can be a genetic mutation. And number three, it's the involvement of the transcription factor. Those three things together define tumor identity. I had three examples here. Uh, the first one on the top is small cell lung cancer. So when, for instance, retinoblastoma and P53 get mutated, and SOX2 is overexpressed. That's one type of small cell lung cancer. Rhabdomyosarcoma is an interesting example because it's a transcription factor fusion. So when these two transcription factors, PAX3 and FOXO fuse, that leads to rhabdomyosarcoma. And lastly, at the bottom is a, also an example you probably have not know about the V600E mutation in BRAF in melanoma, but it also requires the upregulation of a transcription factor for the tumor actually have, have identity. Now, the, another thing, it's clear it's not that simple. And, and what I mean by that, tumors have, uh, very, are very heterogeneous. What we did in our own lab in Cambridge, we mapped a small cell lung cancer. And there are actually three, mostly three predominant types there's something called ASCL1, I want to call that the A type, neuro D1, call it the N type, and then POU2F3 type, we call that the P type. And it is also clear if you look at individual across within a tumor, you can have pu one pure type or a mixture and across tumors. Again, it can be one type or the other or the other. This is all conceptual, but we actually looked at tumor samples. And this is what it looks like. Each one of these uh, columns is a different sample. 
And as you see, most A types indeed overexpress ASCL1. Most P types uh, overexpress this, and most neurotypes this. But there are also others, particularly MIC is involved in many, and also these SOX, SOX1, and SOX2. So it is complicated. So what are we going to do about this? Well, we looked at uh, signatures, and it turned out that the A-type TRN has a lot of inflammatory signatures. So interferon, in particular, PR3K act mTOR. And so if you want to go after the A-type, the ASCL1, you probably uh, want to think about interferon signaling. Uh, in contrast to the N-type, the neurotype, we found many, many genes that have to do with MYC or MYC involvement. So it's probably a good idea to look at MYC inhibition if you go after the N type. So um, the last thing I want to talk about is this MYC deregulation and transcriptional amplification. Because we have a specific interest in MYC. It's clearly a bad actor in many tumors. And why? So here we go from low MYC to high MYC, so this is normal tumors, oncogenic or cancerous uh, uh, tissue. And as you see, with low MYC levels, it binds only to high affinity binding sites, and it, it uh, manages housekeeping genes. But as MYC gets amplified, and I'll tell you in a moment how to what degree, MYC invades sites that it normally where it wouldn't be, and can activate many of these oncogenes. That's how high, low MYC levels are good, and you actually need them. High MYC levels are bad. And this is actually shown here. This is work done by one of our research scientists in, in Cambridge when he was still in academia. And this shows you here on the neuroblastoma cell line. There are four areas in, shaded in, in, uh, in blue where MYC would not normally be, but MYC happens to be in neuroblastoma because it's at such high levels. And what does MYC then do? Well, it hijacks other transcription factors. These are shown here. And it is very clear if these transcription factors are high, it highly expressed people have a much less chance of survival. So it correlates with clinical outcomes. So then in summary, for the first part of my talk, transcription factor deregulation is highly prevalent. It's a hallmark in tumors. Transcription factors are complex, uh, regulators of gene expression. Uh, number four, number three, TRNs define cell identity and are rewired in cancer. And lastly, oncogenic transcription factors, their, their associated networks are often highly selected tumor dependencies. Now, let me get to the second part of my talk. So, okay, this is all interesting science, but what are we as a company doing? Well, so it turns out transcription factors are not amenable to the traditional high-throughput screening. You can't just isolate them and do a high-throughput screen. The reason is they are highly unstructured. Shown here is an alpha-fold predicted uh, three-dimensional structure of MIC. And as you can see, only a small part of MYC is actually structured. The rest is all unstructured. And the reason is these transcription factors occur in complexes, shown on the right-hand side. So unless you screen, you know, what, what our approach then to this is, we screen whole cell lysates, where the transcription factors in, is in its native, native environment. So what we do in our company is three things. First of all, we map these TRNs, and I'll show you an example define the dependency, and then we identify modulators. And I'll talk, talk to you about how are we doing that. It's some, something called SMM, small, mic, small molecule microarray, or we look for critical nodes. And I'm going to do uh, two things, give you an example of all three. First of all, an example of where we are taking um, a generation of clinical transcription inhibitors and purpose them or define them for transcriptional inhibition. The second is an example of identifying a critical node within a TRN and going after that. And the third, I want to explain to you what SMM, small molecule microarray is. So the first example is a CDK9 inhibitor. And that's uh, 
slated or it's intended to go into MIC amplified tumors. Uh, this is the CTK9 inhibitor. It's a fairly um, uh, simple structure, actually. Uh, what does CDK9 do? It's a global regulator of transcription. Transcription initiates and then pauses after about 60 nucleotides, and then it needs CDK9 to phosphorylate RNA polymerase 2 for the transcription to proceed. Uh, this we call KB0742. It came from our, from our own screen. It has an attractive profile, oral bioavailability, long half-life, etc., and the phase one, two trial is ongoing. Now, why do we want to go after MIC amplified tumors? That's shown here in a cartoon form. So first of all, MIC, both the transcript and the protein has a very short half-life. So it needs to be continuously transcribed. And for that, it needs CDK9. So again, for the, for the production of MIC, CDK9 is highly required and important. But then as MIC invades these oncogenic sites where it normally shouldn't be, again, it transcribes oncogenic uh, proteins. And for that, it needs CDK9. So it's like double, it's double dependent on CDK9, both for its own production and for its own activity. So um, again, we're going after tumors that had, are addicted to MIC. And addicted means copy number uh, gain with, with high copy numbers. And we also believe here on the, on the right hand side, it's not a good idea to completely slam CDK9 to nothing because you will get unacceptable toxicity because it is important for all transcription. But we found, at least in preclinical models, if you tone it down to about 50%, you can have an anti tumor effect without having much toxicity. This shows a, uh, uh, both at the uh, mRNA and at the uh, protein level how high the MIC levels are in these nuclei. These are two nuclei here. And the normal cell has between 10 and 40,000 MIC proteins. These, some of these MIC amplified tumors can have 800,000. So uh, probably a 20 to 80 fold increase in, in MIC levels. And that's what we want to reduce. Now, in order to do that, again, what the pharmacokinetic profile that you want from a compound is something like this, where you're in this Goldilocks zone for a while, so you decrease CDK9 activity about 50%. The high copy MIC goes down, but MIC doesn't completely disappear. You don't want something like this that has a short half-life where you have to dose to a high C max and get toxicity. So this was the example with CDK9. As I said, it's in phase one, two, clinical development in a dose escalation. And we hope to be able to identify a phase two dose and then move into MIC amplified tumors. Now, the second is an example of a critical node. And just bear with me. So this is AML. And some of the AML is caused by high Hox-Mees. So Hox-Mees are two transcription factors that are involved in myeloid differentiation. They should normally go up. The myeloid cells differentiate into the, whatever they the differentiate into, and then they are supposed to disappear. But if you have certain mutations like mll menin or MPM1C, they maintain high hox mes levels. These... Uh, um, Promyelocytes don't differentiate into the final myeloid cells, and that causes AML. Now, what was observed here, this was a study done by Kim Stegmeier at Dana-Farber. She found that high hox mes also uh, um, causes high sick levels. So sick levels are sky high. Sick is an intracellular kinase, as many as you may know. And sick then has a feedback on high hox mes and it also activates other things like FLT3. So we thought SIC is a critical node in this Hox-Mees uh, regulatory network. So we have a compound actually acquired from Gilead, uh, entosplatinib. It came with clinical data in more than 1,300 people, uh, has phase two data in 53 patients in AML, and where we really saw the best responses were obtained in those people 
that had either MPN1C mutation or MLL, MLL menin. So it's completely consistent with, with our hypothesis. This moved into phase three, to pivotal study, and we hope to have a readout expected in the second half of 2023. Now the last piece I would like to present to you is so I said, so we define dependencies, that was the CDK9. We define critical nodes, that's sick. And the last piece, identify novel small molecule regu regulators of GRNs. And what we have, this was a technology that came out of MIT, Angela Kohler's lab. And she uh, has a small molecule library that's immobilized on a solid surface. We have the, improved the platform. We have much better signal to noise ratio. We expanded the library. We now have two, two, 240,000 compounds. They were selected both on diversity and on drug-like properties. And what we do now is we, we screen whole cell lysates where the target transcription factor is tagged. And then we can identify direct binders to the transcription factors. They could be binded to something else, to a cofactor, or they could bind through protein-protein interaction. These compounds then are, are identified by an optical readout and selected. And then what we do, so we, this is an example of a mixed screen that we did. So there were four different cell lines that we screened. We selected from these 450,000 compounds, 1,700 that were good binders. And then we asked the question, how many of these are actually biologically active? So we define a transcriptional nanostring profile. So we essentially knock down MIC and ask the question, what genes changes? And these are the genes, some go down, some go up. And then we select, for instance, this compound that mimics the transcriptional profile of the target. And those are the compounds we are then interested in. And next, what we have to do is figure out how do they do this? So we call it target deconvolution. There are two possibilities. Probably the most successful is a bias triage. So we know what all the interactors are with MIC. You know, among them are WDR5 is one. And so we asked the question, okay, if these compounds don't directly bind to MIC, what else could they bind to? And one compound we fished out was indeed a compound that bound to WDR5. We uh, 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 proved it in a, in a FRET assay. And this is that we obtained a crystal structure where we could indeed show that this compound binds to this to this site to the main site of WDR5. So uh, again, the uh, uh, brings me almost to the end of my talk. Uh, I hope I've shown you we we map these TRNs. It gives us insights into what is actually the, the whole signaling pathway, etc. The example of the first where we look for critical dependencies is our CDK9 inhibitor that we're going after uh, MIC amplified tumors. The second one, we look at critical nodes. In this case, we identified SICK. And uh, our SICK inhibitor, as I said, is in phase three in MPM1 mutated AML. And then lastly, we can identify novel uh, mechanisms by this SMM methodology. So let me, at the very end, get back to where I started, and that's to the man we're here to uh, honor. These are just a few more pictures that I uh, picked out of my, I have thousands of these at home. This was in 1996, and we just returned from our first FDA advisory committee meeting on Vistite or Zadophilir. And as you see, all three people are smiling, so it has gone well. The advisory committee recommended uh, uh, approval. And what we did here, you can't see it. I hold up a $5 bill. Howard uh, motions zero and John says four. And what this all means, the compound cytophavir was called GS504. That was our internal number. This is later on at some event that I don't remember. Now here, um, this is at Earl Kern's retirement party in Palm Springs. And also on this slide is the previous speaker, Rich Whitley, and Bill Lee, who was uh, head of research for a long, long time at Gilead. 
So lastly, I, uh, this is a personal kind of greeting or, or what I want to tell John. You are not physically with us anymore, but I want to thank you for your, you were my mentor, my colleague, my friend over many, many years. And even though you're not physically with us anymore, your legacy will certainly live on. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Norbert. We do have time for for some questions. So, uh, Mike Runner's on guard here. Rich, I think your talk was easier, was uh, clinical. This one was more scientific, biological. (laughs) I can ask a a question question here. Yeah. Uh, Uh, yeah. Fantastic talk. It's great to see some early research and. I guess when you're looking at the minimum inhibitory concentration or targeting that zone and seeing when you go high on the pharmacokinetics, right? And you can have global transcription factor suppression. Would you see sort of chemotherapy-like side effects on that level? And the cellular, the toxicity. So the expected, the expected side effect is what we have seen in preclinical talk studies is neutropenia. It's not surprising. And that's what other CDK9 inhibitors have seen. And, uh, you know, we saw in our preclinical model, and this is in mice xenograft, by the way, you take it with a grain of salt, that mice xenograft, that you, if you can knock down MIC by about 50% over a period of about 12 hours, you get a good anti-tumor effect without having toxicity. And these are mice models, and as you know, tumors in mice grow faster. So we think with, in humans, it's probably going to be longer. But we, we have seen a half-life, so we have pharmacokinetic data on this compound. It has a, a, a half-life of 24 hours. It's ideal. And we're dosing it three days on, four days off. That we have found in, again, in preclinical models. You, if you give the same total dose daily, that's much worse than giving the same dose three days on, four days off. And actually, in our preclinical talk studies, we have seen minimal toxicity, uh, some little neutropenia, but it wasn't it wasn't graded. Let me put it that way. Very good. Any other questions from the audience? See none. So let's thank Norbert again. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so it's my pleasure to get to introduce Pete. Um, Pete's my boss. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, so we're, both of us are nervous now because he's worried about what I might say. Uh, but let's just say it's a situation of mutually assured destruction, and I will be entirely complimentary. <laughs> uh, so uh, Pete is a pioneering chemist. His lab has made major contributions using a diversity-based approach for chemistry and synthetic biology and materials. Uh, He has generated catalytic antibodies and added new building blocks to the genetic code. Pete started his academic career at Berkeley where he became a Howard Hughes investigator, but Richard Lerner recruited Pete to Scripps in 1999. And around that time, he also became the director of GNF, which is a La Jolla-based division of Novartis. And he used genomic methods and screening uh, to develop new medicines. Uh, So Pete left GNF and founded Caliber in about 2012, I believe, as a not-for-profit drug discovery institute, which eventually merged within Scripps uh, shortly after he became president uh, in in 2016. In addition, he's been a a serial entrepreneur, uh, founding numerous companies such as Affimax, Cyrix, Calypsis, and, and Ambrix. Now, I think there's two major metrics for someone's excess, uh, success in science. One, of course, is their scientific achievements, uh, but the other part is the training uh, of students and postdocs. And Pete's been an incredible mentor and, in fact, has populated universities all over the country with uh, scientists that have come to his lab uh, for training. Uh, in academic institutions. Uh, he's published prolifically. He's won uh, numerous awards, uh, notably the Wolf Prize, the Tetrahedron Prize, and then last year, 
the National Academy of Sciences Award in Chemical Sciences. Uh, he has served as the president and CEO of Scripps since 2015, continuing the visionary leadership that the Institute has enjoyed since its founding. I can give you a concrete example of that visionary leadership. In 1999, Pete recruited Artem Patapusian to come to Scripps. That was visionary. Please welcome me and join Pete. Did I say what? <laughs> Let's see, is my mic on? Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Um, I'd like to start out by saying a few words about John. Um, I met, I first met John uh, in, in the 1980s. We were both at a symposium at Yale, and uh, John gave a really beautiful talk on, uh, at the time he was leading the antiviral group at BMS, and gave a really beautiful talk on nucleosides and nucleotides as antivirals. And it was the first time I learned something about John. It was a long day, and all I wanted to do was get a beer, and John's, Pete, we got to talk science, okay? And, you know, it was the first you know, realization that John's just enthusiasm for science never stopped, okay? And so we drank beer and ate until late that evening, and it was really enjoyable. And, and, and then I, I, I didn't interact with John for many years, and when I became president of Scripps, I'm like, who would be a brilliant board member to get? And John was, was the obvious person given what we were trying to do. And so I went up to Gilead and talked to John, and John's, you know, Pete, I'm kind of busy right now. I'm CEO and chairman of Gilead, okay? And, and uh, but get back to me in two years. So I, I tend to be persistent, and I did. And John, you know, joined the board, and that was really a wonderful thing for Scripps. And in the first board meeting, I learned something else about John. John was a very to-the-point person, okay? The shortest distance between two points to John is a straight line, okay? And don't deviate. So the first board meeting we were at, <clears throat> there was an extended discussion of a topic for, for quite a while, and John was completely quiet. And then the chairman, John Diegman, turned to John and, and said, John, what do you think? And he just said, why well, I think we ought to let peaches do it. <laughs> and that was all he said, and we were done. <laughs> okay. So that was John. And and then, you know, John was actually um gonna become chairman of the board um after John Diekman stepped down. But but unfortunately, you know, his untimely passing, uh uh that didn't come to be. And I think that's probably one of the biggest losses Scripps has had in, in the recent um, past. Um, the other um, uh, interesting thing about John it, is you can really tell <laughs> something about a person by the person, people he hires and associates himself with. And, and, you know, when you interact with the team he put together at Gilead, which I have since, since I got to know John better, it's really pretty, not only remarkable in terms of their scientific ability, but also in terms of, of just the, the, them as human beings. And I think that really kind of reflects John, okay? And, and finally, you know, John is one of my heroes. And uh, to be truthful, that's a pretty rarefied group. And the question is why? And I think John should really be a role model for young scientists, and, and we gave John an honorary degree because I wanted our young graduating uh, students to hear from John. And, and, and if you think about it, John was an outstanding scientist, okay? And you could talk science with him almost any topic. But what really was impressive about John is what he did with the science and the impact that science had on society. And so, you know, we've heard about the antiviral, we, we heard about his first antiviral for CMV, but then we heard about HIV, we hepatitis C, 
So John really did have an impact on countless lives through his science. And not only that, he actually did something beyond that. He really pounded the table to distribute those medicines to you know, the developing world. And I, I think over 100 countries have received low-cost medicines because John wanted it done. So, you know, to me, that's an incredibly impressive, you know, career. It's, it's not only doing outstanding science, but it's having an outstanding impact on the people through the science you do. So, so he's one of my heroes. Um, so I was thinking about what to talk about. And I thought, well, maybe I ought to talk about our drug discovery programs because that's what John did, and he was really interested in it. So then I thought, you know, going back, I look back at what I talked about back at Yale in the late 80s, and I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll tell where that story is gone. Um, and, and so I thought that would be a good thing to do because people accuse me of a lack of focus. And so 1985 to 2022 is 37 years I've been working on this problem, <laughs> okay? And I thought I'd give you an update. And the other thing is, is I think when you become president of an institution like Scripps, people assume you're brain dead uh, to do something like that. And I'd like to try and give a couple of counterexamples to <laughs> today. Um, so what I thought I'd do is, is really continue the theme of, of what we were doing in the early days at Berkeley, and that's synthesis. But it's not synthesis in the traditional sense of chemical synthesis. It's synthesis at the interface of chemistry and biology. I, you use chemistry and biology together to make new molecules, complex molecules, systems of molecules that you can't make using chemistry or biology alone. So that was the theme of what I was talking about. And what we were doing, we were introducing unnatural amino acids into proteins in a test tube. <clears throat> and at the time, I thought that was pretty good. Um, but, you know, we, we came to ask whether we can actually do that in living organisms, okay? And so could we actually um, expand the genetic code of, of uh, bacteria and maybe higher organisms? And, and the genetic code is kind of the unifying theme of all of life. It's the one thing that's conserved across all of evolution. We all have 20 amino acid building blocks with the exception of a small handful of proteins. And, and so the question we ask as chemists is a third of these are boring, okay? I wouldn't have done that, but then I'm down here and not up there, okay? But if you're going to add amino acids to code, what would you add? And how many would you add? And so we began to ask that question if we could really expand, rationally expand the genetic code. You know, what new proteins could we make and could we actually make cells with interesting and improved properties? So how do you do that? Well, uh, nature has invested over a billion years in making an incredibly uh, efficient machine to translate nucleic acid sequence to protein sequence, the ribosome. And we know uh, the structure of this at atomic resolution. So it's really a chemical problem. And we said, well, how do we reprogram this machine to add new building blocks to the code? And so it's pretty simple. You need blank codons that code for your new amino acid, and, and you can get that from stop codons. There are three stop codons. You only stop once, so you have two blanks. You can go to a four-base code. You can delete codons from the genome. You then build a tRNA that recognizes your new codon, no other codons. You then evolve the loading enzyme, the amino acyl tRNA synthetase, to load your new tRNA with an amino acid and no other tRNA and for instance, E. coli. And then um, uh, you actually have to get that amino acid into the living cell. So we solved those problems through a combination of structure-based design and, and in vitro evolution methods. Um, and now I think in our lab and other labs, over 150 amino acids have been genetically encoded um, beyond the common 20. And, and yields of five grams per liter on a, on a 
2,000 liter fermenter scale. So, so this is really robust. So what kinds of, of new building blocks can you add? You can add fluorophores, metal binders, photo cross linkers, PTMs, and molecules with orthogonal chemical reactivity. That is, they don't react with any of the natural amino acids in the cell. And doing that is really interesting nowadays because people want to selectively modify proteins with biophysical probes, but perhaps more interestingly, with drugs, for instance, antibody drug conjugates. And this is the old idea of Ehrlich's magic bullet. You put a highly cytotoxic cancer drug on an antibody that targets it to a cancer cell, you increase efficacy, you increase safety. The problem is, is how do you put a drug onto an antibody? Usually you do that with electrophilic chemistry. There are lots of lysines, lots of cysteines. So what you generate is a mess. Okay, and you know, biologists are allowed to put a mess into human trials, but chemists in general aren't. Okay, so the question is, can we solve that problem? And so what we said is, yeah, it's really simple. You just genetically encode an amino acid with orthogonal chemical reactivity, for instance, an aero ketone. We did that, and so to test this, we put it into receptin, and you can actually now put it at very defined sites with very defined stoichiometries. So you could do what medicinal chemists do and actually make changes to the structure and optimize the pharmacology and the efficacy. And so we did that. And it worked very well in preclinical models. And then Ambrix actually took a variant of, of, of this antibody. And it's in clinical trials in, in, in TDM1 failure patients. It's shown an 80% um, overall response rate. So it really looks quite impressive, and I think it points to the fact that if you can begin to do really precise chemistry in making these ADCs, it gives you an advantage. So there's a lot of interest in cell biological probes. For instance, you know, there's a huge interest in post-translational modifications to proteins. What do they do? It's hard to study because it's hard to make a PTM at a specific site in the proteome. A simple solution to that is just to genetically encode the post-translational modification. So we did that with phosphotyrosine and actually phosphonotyrosine, a stable analog, and we genetically encoded it in good yields, and we solved the structure of the, the synthetase that loads that amino acid onto the tRNA, and just, you see between the gray and the blue, large structural changes. And that's what happens when you change the specificity. These enzymes are incredibly plastic, and that's why you can change the genetic code so easily. Um, we've, we and others now have made a large number of PTMs, for instance, in looking at histone modifications to study transcription. Uh, we, we now have over eight or 10 uh, 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 PTMs that we can introduce genetically into proteins. The other interest in cell biology is mapping protein interactomes, okay? How do you tell what a protein does? It is of unknown function. The simplest way to get insights into that is to look at what it interacts with in the cell. And that's usually done by immunoprecipitation mass spec. But so many of the protein interactions you're interested in are transient, the complexes aren't stable to the pull-down conditions and so forth and so on. So what you really want to do is fix, covalently fix, those interactions in a living cell. And so the way to do that is simply site-specifically introduce a photo crosslinker, and we've genetically encoded quite a few of these. And you can crosslink proteins to protein, CDK5 to PAC1, or proteins to DNA, okay, cap to its operator sequence. And, and most recently, uh, in collaboration with Mike Ballung, we actually use this approach to probe the function of short open reading frame encoded peptides. These are small proteins that were really missed when the genome was originally annotated because of their small size and sometimes novel start sequences and so forth and so on. So how do you figure out what these do? Well, let's figure out what they interact with. They're so small that those complexes are probably unstable. So all we did was put a flag tag at the beginning or the end of the SEP and introduce the photo crosslinker throughout the SEP. We don't know where it's going to, what's the best site. Introduce those into living cells, crosslinked, and pulled down. And so we started this with a known SEP MRI2, and we actually pulled down the known interactors of MRI2. 
uh, they're involved in DNA repair, but we've pulled down some also unknown interactors. Um, so that kind of validated the approach. So we went over to Alan Saglitalian's lab at Salk and said, Alan, give us some more targets. So he said, well, here's 24 CEPs that are conserved in mammalian cells. So we just did the experiment with shotgun with all 24 in, in one experiment. We found the interactomes of eight. And so we looked at this one. It's obvious even I can tell what this interacts with, histone 2B, okay? So we actually confirmed that. Um, we, we confirmed it by Western blot, but we also measured the binding interaction. And the, the KD is 25 nanomolar. Uh, it localizes the chromatin. Uh, chip seq um, uh, indicates it, it plays a transcriptional regulatory role and, and it alters the transcription of a, a significant number of genes. So in this case, CEP10 is surprisingly as a micropeptide, a transcriptional regulator, and probably others are too. What else can you do um, in biochemistry with an expanded genetic code? Well, there's a lot of interest in protein folding. And a lot of protein folding events occur on a sub-microsecond time scale. And we really don't have good tools to study that, to initiate and probe those events. Um, so we asked whether we can actually phototrigger protein unfolding, and how would we do that? So we look at a large amino acid, genetically encoded amino acid, this tetrazine derivative. And if you put that large amino acid into the core of a protein, for instance, we put it into this protein, GPW, it's a bacterial lambda phage protein, and we substituted um, phenylalanine 35 with this large amino acid. It actually leads to packing interactions that lead to a, a melting temperature for that protein of about 83 degrees. When you photolyze it, it falls apart on a 10 picosecond time scale, okay? You generate the nitrile, you blow out acetonitrile and nitrogen, so you make a big hole in the protein, which destabilizes the protein, and now the protein melts at 69 degrees. So we put in a fret pair here to monitor the full protein unfolding, and now all we're going to do is unfold it photochemically at this intermediate temperature. And the laser just arrived. We're doing this with, with, with the Shook's lab here at Scripps. Now, the other thing people are interested in is clearly vaccines. Um, and live vaccines in general tend to be very good, but they tend to have a safety issue. Um, so there's, there's interest in making organisms whose replication depends on the presence of a synthetic small molecule, not in hosts, for instance, a non-canonical amino acid. And a number of strategies have been developed to do this. We, we actually developed a strategy based on the, the formation of a bioorthogonal protein interface. That is, we went into a homodimeric protein, charismate mutase, which is an essential protein in E. coli, and we replaced this tyrosine with a large benzophenone side chain. Protein doesn't homodimerize, it's inactive. We then repack the other side of the benzophenone to make a stable interface. And you can do that really easily with, with genetic selections. Um, and when we did that, we repacked it. We got basically wild type catalytic activity when we grew this mutant charismic mutase on benzophenone amino acid. Uh, it grows in the presence of benzophenone containing amino acids with wild type, almost wild type growth rate. It doesn't grow in the absence, but importantly, the escape rate is, is basically 10 to the minus 11th, uh, which is well below the FDA uh, limit for a live vaccine. The problem here is, is if you use this as a live vaccine, the pathogen can just get aromatic amino acids from the host. So we went in and adapted this strategy uh, to another protein, uh, homodimer sliding clamp protein, DNAN, that's involved in DNA replication uh, in almost every bacteria. So, and here again, we used a more sophisticated genetic selection to select for these new bioorthogonal interfaces. And now we actually have a DNAN 
that grows in the presence of this amino acid, unnatural amino acid, with basically wild type rates. And in the absence, it doesn't grow at all, but we cannot measure its escape rate, <laughs> okay? So this thing's pretty bulletproof. And so now we're actually trying to use this to make um, uh, live vaccines for Pseudomonas and uh, pathogenic E. coli. Now, that's designed. We go back to the original question I asked. If we find life on another planet and it has a 21 amino acid code, is it going to have an evolutionary advantage compared to us? And so we tested that notion uh, first um, in an experiment where we basically put E. coli under selective pressure. And what we did is expressed HIV protease um, in the cytosol of E. coli. And when HIV protease is active, it cleaves a tetracycline antiporter, and the cells are sensitive to tetracycline and die. So then we said, let's make an inhibitor, a cyclic peptide inhibitor of HIV protease. So we used some, 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 some technology Steve Bankovic had developed to make libraries of cyclic peptides. And we looked for a cyclic peptide inhibitor of HIV protease, and you're going to find it because the cells are living. And we said, we gave... We gave this problem to a 20 amino acid bacterium, and we gave it to our engineered 21st amino acid bacterium, and we asked who would win, and 21 beat 20. And what the bugs did is they learned organic chemist, sophomore organic chemistry really quickly. They figured out if you put a ketone into a peptide that binds on the surface of HIV protease, it'll form a shift base with lysine 14, block the dimer interface and then activate the protease, which is really pretty clever, okay? So as soon as you get E. coli, more than 20 amino acids, it figures out how to use them in very clever ways. So then we said, can we actually improve the stability of a protein as well with the 21 amino acid code? So we took a protein um, called MED-A. The growth at E. coli at elevated temperatures depends on the thermal stability of MED-A. So it provides a simple selection. You just grow bugs at high temperature and see what lives. So what we did is we randomized half of the amino acids in MED-A, and we put in independent experiments one of 15 unnatural amino acids at each one of those sites, threw them on plates at 42 degrees, and said, what wins? And in this case, the protein we isolated had greater than a 20 degree difference in thermal stability from a single mutation, which is almost unheard of with a common 20 amino acid. So again, if you give mother nature more building blocks, it figures out really interesting and powerful solutions to problems in evolution. Now, that's 21, how do you go to 23, 25? But that answer is kind of obvious. You go to a four-base codon, and you go to a four-base anticodon, which is pretty simple. You just insert a four-base cognate anticodon into the anticodon loop of the tRNA. And that works really well. A lot of other people are doing this now and generating sets of tRNA synthetase pairs so you can put multiple amino acids into a single protein. But the problem is, is when you're reading out four bases, you're competing with three bases. So you have a competition, which isn't good. Even if you compete with a stop code on TAG, you're con competing with termination factors, okay? Uh, one of which is RF1 that recognizes T TAG. So George Church and I were talking, and he has a lot bigger lab budget than I do. And I said, George, why don't you take out all the TAGs out of the E. coli genome? And he said, sure, I can do that, Pete. So he did, which means you could take out the termination factor, and now you're competing with nothing when you go to a four-base codon and the yields go way up. So that, that looks like a really pretty robust solution. Um, and then, you know, people were starting to expand the genetic hose of flies and worms. So we said, well, we got to do mammalian cells. And so we and others have created ways to do this. One of the best we've created is a baculovirus system which really efficiently introduces into mammalian cells all the tools required to, to add amino acids to the code, and it works in cell lines, primary cells, stem cells, and so forth. So to show the utility of this, we actually 
asked whether we could genetically encode a small molecule fluorophorin mammalian cells. And, you know, GFP is an incredibly powerful tool in proteins because you can image proteins, it's fluorescent. But it's a big ball that you can really only put on one end or the other of a protein. So wouldn't it be nice if you could put a small fluorophore anywhere you wanted in the proteome? So we genetically encoded ProDan, um, which is an environmentally sensitive fluorophore. And we put it in a protein called glutamine binding protein. So we've replaced this, this asparagine with ProDan. And then we just added and titrated directly by fluorescence the binding constant. And it was pretty much wild type. So we think this is a really useful tool. And others are using it. Now, every one of the experiments I've described to date is a genetically encoded, it, it, it's a bacterium with an expanded genetic code, but we feed the 21st amino acid to the bug. So they aren't autonomous. So we said, well, can we actually make a completely autonomous organism that genetically encodes a 21st amino acid and also biosynthesizes it? So we did that. We genetically encoded paraminophenylalanine, which is a bioorthogonal handle for proteins. And you can make that from charismic acid by adding three enzymes from streptomyces. And so we did that. And this bacterium is a 21 amino acid bacterium. It grows on LB. If I throw it in the dirt, it'll grow. If I come back in a million years, it'd be interesting to see what happens, OK? I wouldn't do that experiment in La Jolla, but I might do it in our nation's capital. Okay? <laughs> um, so given we did that, we said, whoa. What about a mouse? Can we make a 21 amino acid mouse? Talk about total syntheses, okay? That would be impressive, okay? So how are you gonna do that? The obvious thing to do is make a 21 amino acid embryonic stem cell. That was a little too hard for us. It probably still is. So we said, well, let's make hematopoietic stem cells. These are stem cells that make all the blood types. Let's make a 21 amino acid hematopoietic stem cell, and then all the cells in the blood system are going to be 21 amino acids. So to do that, we used an EVB-based um, episomal vector system, and we did this in vitro with human cells to begin with. And you can see in vitro, we actually can genetically encode a 21st amino acid, in this case, Bach lysine, and, and really pretty good yield, not only in HSCs, but in their progeny. And so we said, okay, let's, let's engraft these HSCs in a mouse. And actually, we now have a mouse where about 20% of the mouse blood contains 21 amino acid cells. So the really $64,000 experiment is, is, is challenge the mice with an immunogen and see whether the antibodies actually have an unnatural amino acid in the, the variable region. Um, so... That, that's kind of the continuation of the story uh, I first told when John and I met at Yale and, and gave talks at the symposium. And I think using chemistry and biology together, you know, the genetic code has been conserved for over a billion years and has limited life, okay? I think using chemistry and biology together, we've removed to a great degree. We and others have removed that constraint. And I think it, it really will allow you to make interesting proteins and interesting whole organisms. Now, as we were doing this, we were thinking, okay, we need more codons, because we got a lot of amino acids we can add to the code. How are we going to do that? Well, as I said, you can go to a four-base codon, but you can also go to three-base pairs. So instead of having four times four times four, 64 codons, you have six times six times six, 216 codons. So that was the easier way to get new codons. So Floyd and I started a collaboration when I moved to Scripps to ask whether we could make a third base pair. And the notion we used was hydrophobic, hydrophobic orthogonality. I had the Watson Crick base pairs hydrogen bond with each other. If you're in water and you have hydrophobic base pairs, they're going to want to get out of water, so it's going to form a stable base pair. And moreover, they're not going to bond, they're not going to pair with hydrogen bond donors or acceptors. And so we were really quite successful in doing this, making stable selective base pairs. We showed that you can enzymatically incorporate those into DNA, and then Floyd, in a, a really remarkable experiment, showed you could do that in living cells at a single site. So we said, well, that's really interesting. Can we go into back the bacterial genome 
and replace every one of his, one of the four bases with a new base structure, okay? So can you replace all cytidines, for example, with hydroxymethylcytidine in the entire E. coli genome? So why did we think we could do that? Well, first of all, it's an interesting base because it's involved in as an epigenetic regulator in, in eukaryotes. But moreover, we knew T4 phage had already done that, a complete re replacement of cytidine with hydroxymethylcytidine, in some cases glycosidated. So in a, a simple experiment, we took a bunch of T4 genes and reprogrammed nucle uh, uh, nucleotide synthesis, okay? And we got up to a genome that had about 65% hydroxymethyl C instead of C. And we said, well, how do we get the rest of the way? And so we developed what we thought was a clever genetic selection, and we carried it out. And we didn't increase the hydroxymethyl C at all. We just decreased it to zero. But what we found in this strain is when we isolated the genomic DNA and analyzed it, half of the G, deoxy G, was replaced by ribose G. And half of the deoxy A was replaced by ribose A. Okay, some of the C, none of the U, uh, none of the T. And so this was a shock, okay? So the first thing is, is an RNA contaminant, you don't detect U. You would if it was an RNA contaminant. We did spiking experiments, it's, it ruled out an artifact. Where is this coming from? Is it coming from, you know, replicator primer re, uh, repair defects? Nah, because that's only a couple percent. So we were at a loss. So we said, well, let's really prove this to ourselves. It could be just some weird RNA-DNA hybrid. So what we did is isolate genomic DNA, break it down, and analyze the dye and trinucleotides. And what we found was riboses covalently linked to deoxyriboses, okay? And what? This is really unprecedented. And we found that in the dye and trinucleotides. So it's a covalent linkage. And so, if that's true, those genomes, large fragments of those genomes should be sensitive to RNAs, and in fact they are. Uh, DH10B is resistant to RNAs. These strains are cleaved by RNAs1 and RNAs H. And, and then we're like, okay, this can't be. that It's gotta be multiple genome. So in E. coli that have replication defects, you can get multiple genomes. Okay, we have our chimeric genome and we have a normal genome, okay? So you can just radio label the genomic uh, DNA with high, high specific activity, um, P32, and measure the number of genomes, and it's one, okay? So this is an uh, information storing genome. And so we said, well, let's look at the metabolome. And what we saw were our engineering of those cells really led to significant drops in the, the deoxy levels of cGNA, but not T. So that explains why, you know, you didn't see U. Okay. Um, and, but there was no effect on ribose levels. So we said, well, let's take polymerase outside of a cell and see what happens when you increase ribose over deoxyribose, and you start to get ribose into DNA. So all of this made sense, and then we said, well, let's just sequence the DNA and look for the, the mutations we made. And the problem is this is unstable DNA. It's filled with RNA. It's really hard to isolate and sequence. So we kind of hit, we looked at some candidate genes, ribonucleotide reductase and others, but we hit a wall, and we think the way around this wall to really characterize the system is you need an orthogonal replication system in E. coli that replicates a plasmid, but not the genome. And how do you do that? Well, Chang Lu did it with a yeast system. We wanted to do it with bacteria. It hadn't been done. So we developed um, this, this system that's a work in progress where we're using a, a T7 as the orthogonal replication system. The, the problem is you just use T7, you get all these concatamers. So you have to terminate replication, and we're using an N15 protelomerase to terminate replication. And, and so this is a work in progress. We, we've made a lot of progress in, in basically developing this replication cycle. And I, I think we'll have it soon, which will allow us to probe this problem but also do continuous evolution in E. coli, which will be important. But the take-home lesson here 
it, we started out with, with a, a, a hypothesis of what we could do. We wound up with a serendipitous discovery. And what does that mean? Well, you know, in evolution, there's this theory now. We started with an RNA world where RNA stored all the genetic information, and now we're a DNA world. And how did you go from an RNA world to a DNA world? Well, now we have a genome that's half RNA and half DNA. DNA. So we may have accidentally uh, generated a, a putative intermediate in early evolution. Um, so that got us going, and we started saying, well, what else can we look at in evolution? Well, how about the evolution of prokaryotes to eukaryotes? What happens there? Well, you get a nucleus, but you also get mitochondria. Mitochondria are the energy-producing organelles and eukaryotes. And where did they come from in evolution? Well, it's thought that early pro-eukaryotes engulf prokaryotes. Now the prokaryotes are providing the ATP to the eukaryote. Okay. And the eukaryote is making all the amino acids, cofactors, and everything else that the E. coli needs. So all of a sudden, the E. coli, the bacteria, can, it's not E. coli, uh, can begin to throw off genes. And so you begin to minimize to a mitochondrial genome. So that's the theory. How do you recapitulate that and see if you can recapitulate that? Well, we use yeast as our eukaryote. We knocked out COX-2, so the mitochondria don't make ATP. And then we made an E. coli that spits out ATP by putting an ATP translocate into the E. coli. And we also had to coat the E. coli with what are called snare-like proteins so they aren't degraded by the yeast cytosol. And then we used a modification of a method used by Venter and Hutchinson to actually introduce living E. coli into yeast cells. And the idea was this should be in, in the stable endosymbiote system. And in fact, it is. Here you see we labeled the G, uh, E. coli with GFP. We see four E. coli swimming around and yeast providing energy to the yeast. Okay, if you kill the E. coli, you kill the yeast. And when you isolate the genomes, you isolate E. coli genes and yeast genes. So we were pretty excited about this. So we said, okay, now can we begin to minimize this genome? So we, we did it um, on a candidate basis. We said, well, let's get rid of all the amino acid, biosynthetic genes, and all of the cofactors. And we were able to remove those each one at a time, and that worked, and, but this is slow. So Hutchinson actually developed a better method when he was working on minimal genome, and that's basically just to introduce transposons into the E. coli, throw them into a yeast, make an endosymbiont, and see what survives, and then sequence the E. coli and see what genes are gone. So we built this system, and that's the experiments we're about to start now. I think we'll really be able to minimize the genome. But as I was talking to the folks in the group, I said, God, we got to get rid of the cell wall. Because <laughs> mitochondria don't have a cell wall. They just have a double membrane. And I'm like, this shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> and they said, you're crazy, OK? <laughs> it's never going to work. But then um, David Dick pointed out that there are these bacteria called L-form bacteria, where if you grow um, bacteria, bacillus or E. coli, on antibiotics that target cell wall biosynthesis, you can destroy the cell wall, okay? But you need to do that in a high osmolality medium so the E. coli just don't burst. And then you can make them stable by getting rid of one of the cell wall biosynthetic genes. So we've been able to reproduce all of this. This is in a collaboration with Jeff Arrington. Um, We've been able to reproduce all of this and make stable L-forms. And now we've put them and made endosymbionts of these L-forms in yeast. And we think we now have member, uh, cell wallless, uh, now minimized um, bacterial endosymbionts. And we just need to prove that and probably cryo, uh, one of the cryotomography may be the method. So the other question is, how can this be stable? You got E. coli replicating this fast and yeast replicating this fast. It's not a stable system. So we just started plating out into symbionts and selecting for things that were stable, i.e. they could undergo 
multiple, multiple platings, okay, um, and multiple rounds of cell division. And we found a stable end of symbiont, which is based by how many rounds of replication will it do and be stable. And it had transposon insertions into these three genes, RCSC, CPXA, and ID and K. And that kind of made sense because these genes are involved in biofilm formation, cell growth, okay, stress response, and other things. And we thought, okay, so we inserted transposons into these genes. We made the knockouts, and none of them worked. And so then we looked at the transposon insertion sites, and they were always at the same site, always, which means you're changing the function of the genes. You're not knocking them out. So we actually, for instance, um, in RCSC, the transposon insertion is here at this position. And it turns out our hypothesis is, is this removes a back transfer uh, phosphorylation pathway, makes the whole pathway constitutively active, and you're really altering capsid biosynthesis and cell division, okay? Maybe motility. So that's the current hypothesis we're exploring here. Now, we then started saying, well, if we can make, if we're going to begin to evolve mitochondria in the lab, we're starting to get big heads, okay? We're like, okay, let's look at the cell wall. This is complicated peptidoglycan architecture. Is this a unique solution to holding in the guts of E. coli, okay? Or can you have other cell wall architectures? So how do you begin to probe this? So as a first step, we decided to replace the cross-link in the peptidoglycan with a completely non-canonical cross-link. And so that's not that hard to do because people had figured out the amino acid exchange where you can actually put an unnatural building block into the cell wall at the site of the cross-link. So we said, we don't know what's going to work. Let's try these suffix analogs. Let's try these vinyl cell phones. Let's try these isothiocyanates. And so we put them all in, and the one that worked the best um, was the suffix chemistry as the amino acid acceptor of diaminopamelic acid. We formed this new sulfonamide. And when you have 16 millimolar of the D suffix, you actually get 38 per almost 40% of the cross links are non canonical. Okay. Now, surprisingly, these E. coli don't have an altered phenotype. It's like, what? This doesn't make sense, okay? Um, so we then did the experiment in bacillus, and actually now you start to get a bacillus that actually has a curl structure instead of a, a rod-shaped structure. So the question is, now that we got our foot in the door, can we go further? So we're now making bigger building blocks to begin to replace more of the peptidoglycan structure and so we're, we're making MUREF and MUREE substrates, and then we're evolving MUREE and MUREF to actually take these new substrates. And then the final story I thought I'd tell you. Um, I was talking to Anton one day at some beer, beer thing, um, and he said, you know what you ought to work on, Pete, is Botox. Uh, why would I want to work on Botox, okay? You look at my face and it's obvious, okay? But, but he said, you know, they're changing the specificity of Botox to cleave different snap, snaps. And so what is Botox? Botox is a toxin that has a heavy and light chain. The heavy chain binds and transports the light chain into neurons. The light chain is a highly selective protease. Um, the cleave SNAP25, which leads to an inability to release acetylcholine at the axon, okay? What's amazing about this protease is it's safe to use for cosmetic purposes, okay? And it lasts for a long time, okay, when you use it. Um, so we said there's a huge interest now in making targeted protein degradation. What better way to do this than to change the specificity of Botox protease to cleave a new therapeutic substrate. So the minimum kind of recognition sequence of Botox is 17 amino acids. Here's the substrate in red, okay, and the, the, the protease is, is in the rest of the colors. Um, so the, the, the good thing about having so many great students, and I've been 
blessed is they're great. The bad thing about them is I can no longer recruit graduate students because they all want to work for my really good ex-students, okay? It's funny. There was a story. I'll tell the story. We were interviewing uh, graduate students. We always interview prospective graduate students. And we take them to lunch, and I'm sitting there at lunch with a prospective graduate student and some of my colleagues around the table. And I said to the, this woman who was there, really bright, I said, what are you interested in? I'm interested in chemical biology. And I said, that's great. Who are you interested in working for? And she said, you or David Liu. And I said, how are you going to decide? And she said, well, when I came here, I thought I wanted to work for you. But now that I'm here, I think I want to work for somebody younger and more dynamic. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so one of my colleagues looks at me. I don't know if it was Phil or somebody. And it's like, what? Is Pete going to say to this, okay? So I said, I looked at her and I said, I didn't blink an eye. I said, you know, learning chemical biology is a little like learning the force. Would you rather learn from Yoda or Luke Skywalker? Okay. <laughs> so at another symposium at Yale, Dave happened to be introducing me. And he said, you know, when I worked for my mentor, he was a little younger, but He's aged a little, and he puts up this picture of Yoda, okay? So she cl clearly went to Harvard, worked for Dave, and told her the story, okay? But Dave had the same idea we had. <laughs> um, the good news is, so we're competing with Dave, too, for science. Dave actually created a selection scheme that, that allows you to select for altered protease sequences, and what he does is he links T7 RNA polymerase to lysozyme, which inhibits the T7 polymerase. You put the recognition sequence in here, you clip it with a selective protease, you release T7, and you can transcribe a resistance marker, a fluorophore. So we did that with GFP. And then we started, we took a different approach. Dave is doing random mutagenesis with continuous phage evolution. We said, we took the same approach we took to amino acyl tRNA synthetases. Let's look at the specific subsites that interact, have the major interactions with substrate. Let's look at what we have to change. We gotta go from SNAP25, we chose alpha-synuclein, okay? Which is, you know, clearly a target in Parkinson's disease. So if we're gonna change this protease to go from SNAP25 to alpha-synuclein, let's change it two or three amino acids at a time and let's focus on one of these sites first, then the second site, then the third site, then look at synergy, then look at the loops, then make single point mutations. So that's what we're doing. And so we did three rounds. And actually, in three rounds, we went from SNAP25 to alpha-synuclein. We are cleaving uh, uh, a 25 we're cleaving 26 amino acids of alpha-synuclein where we want to cleave. We're now putting it in the whole protein and showing we can cleave it in the whole protein. But we're cleaving 25 amino acids uh, after round three very selectively, and we aren't touching SNAP25, okay? So we think this is actually doable. Um, and the question is, how do you get it now into the neuron? Well, there are toxins that actually invade dopaminergic neurons, so that we can just make a chimeric toxin. But you can actually replace the drug on an antibody drug conjugate, I think, with this protease, and it'll be internalized. And the good news, we know from Botox, it'll probably be safe, and you'll probably only have to do an injection once every three to six months, okay? So, so we're continuing to move along this path. So hopefully I've showed you that using chemistry and biology together, you can make new and interesting things, okay? Um, this is my current group, uh, just a remarkable group of people who sort of solved all these crazy problems that we've had along the way. Um, and these are a terrific group of collaborators. And then, I should just point out, like Jamie said, that the, the nicest thing absolutely about being a professor um, is all the students you train. Um, and so when I turned 60, uh, we had a 60th birthday party, and it was two and a half days of science and drinking. Okay, but it was a great time. I think the only 
everybody here is looking forward to me turning 70, except for me, okay? Because we're going to have another bigger party, okay? Um, but anyway, I've been lucky to have those people. Um, I've been really lucky to know John, and we had to have John involved in scripts. And as I said, he's one of my heroes. Thanks. Great. Great. Th thanks, Biba. We'll take some questions, but I I'd like to ask the first question. And what was the uh, significance of the fact that everyone was wearing a blue shirt? They were. <laughs> I, I think it was they were making fun of you. That's they what were I think. wearing a blue shirt. <laughs> Everybody was wearing a blue shirt. So when you uh, could start to buy clothes online, I decided I could buy 10 pairs of pants and 10 shirts at the same time, and I had them for eight years. <laughs> so uh, questions questions for Pete. Yes, Norbert. Pete, maybe I missed this, but in the unnatural amino acid work, how did you make the tRNA synthetase that it recognizes a novel anticodon and a novel amino acid? Yeah, so what you first do is you make the, so so we first use this, one of the stop codons, the amber stop codon. And what we did was change a sequence of a known tRNA that loads tyrosine, okay, to recognize that sequence, which was easy to do. You just change the anticodon. That's what Watson Crick based pairs, okay? And then what we did is uh, uh, we took the amino acyl tRNA synthetase and we made a library in the active site where we targeted it, and we had a negative selection. So any of those synthetases that recognized a natural amino acid and loaded it killed the cells. So we got rid of any mutant in that library that would load a natural. And then what we did is a positive selection where we grew that mutant library, the remaining mutants, on the unnatural amino acid and did a positive selection. And that works. You know, it's, it's trivial. Yeah, there, there we used EVB, EBV um, as an episomal vector. Okay, um, that was a trick there. People have actually done transient uh, 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 transfection. Right now, that's the method being used for production. They're actually up to five grams per liter of the antibody in mammalian cells just by transient transfection. Uh, but for, for the hematopoietic stem cell work, that's what we did was EVV. For the others, we used baculovirus and other systems. Okay. Pete, what is the evolutionary pressure to keep the amino acid count at 20? That's a good question, Lou. Um, so... When we first did this, we patented it, okay? And then somebody figured out that there's some, uh, some, some archaebacteria that genetically encode pyrolysine. And when they figured out how they did it, it was a stop codon, it was a synthetase with altered specificity, and it was an engineered tRNA. So it's kind of like God violated our patents, okay? <laughs> you know? And not really. So it turns out it was easy. So why didn't Mother Nature do it except with, you know, pyrolysine and selenocysteine, which is complicated? And, you know, I don't have the answer to that because if Mother Nature wants an electrophilic amino acid, it goes through all the work of making thiamine or pyridoxal. It's a lot of work, okay? It could just put a keto amino acid in. I think it's a little like golf. When you go out to the golf course, you think this is a simple game. You go to the driving range, you hit balls. You start getting good enough, you get good enough, and you decide you can play golf. And then you go out and play golf, and you're never all that good, okay? I think Mother Nature was the same. 20 amino acid, got it good enough, let's start evolving life, okay? And it never did better, okay? Why it didn't go back and fix that, I don't know. You've only question. been doing it 37 years as opposed to a billion. <laughs> Focus. <laughs> Other questions? There's one up here. I'll, let me ask one while she's running up. Um, I, 
I'm astonished by the replacement in the genome of the ribose. Yeah. And, and so when you make RNA-DNA hybrids, they're A-form, not B-form. Correct. And so you must have tremendous impacts on the chromatin structure in the nucleoid. So, so, so what, what, it, when, when you, you know start about? inserting riboses into DNA, you start flipping from B-form to A-form, and that changes a lot of things, okay? Mm -hmm. So we said, what are the smallest fragments? Maybe there are runs and then whatever. So we isolated small fragments, 30, and we found them in 30... 30 base pair fragments. So they're distributed throughout. So that's mm -hmm. a question, okay. You put a ribose in, how does how do some of the transcription factors work? Right. You know, uh, you know, and, and like I say, the challenge is, is this is an incredibly unstable genome. So I think that's why you really need these orthogonal mm -hmm. systems to be able to make the fine changes in the genome and then look at a small piece of DNA. But if your graduate student had proposed that, you would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> That's why yeah, I've never great. sent so this to NIH. Question, for question up here. Yeah. So a crazy question on that note was uh, you, you mentioned that the escape rate for um, one of the uh, live vi live uh, bacterial uh, vaccine system was somewhere around five times ten to the minus eleven. I'm wondering if you can, uh, you know, what the FDA might think in that case if your dosing strategy was probably significantly lower than uh, what would really happen in a true. That yeah, so system. the answer is it's less than that. We cannot detect an escapee. And the reason is, is because you have to mutate two bases in the codon to actually change the amino acid to complement that. And it can't happen uh, with any kind of reasonable probability. But to, 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 to nail it to the wall, we're putting two of them in. And when you put two of them in, it, it's not going to be an issue. Okay, if there's no other questions, let's thank Pete for a terrific presentation. It's now my honor and pleasure to introduce Lillian Liu, who's an accomplished biochemist and John's life partner. Lily is the president and program director of the John C. Martin Foundation and has managed that foundation since its inception in 2014. And prior to her leadership role in the foundation, she had 20 years of work in the pharmaceutical industry focusing on viral hepatitis and inflammatory diseases such as lupus, as well as HIV. Her experience spans many key areas of science and global health, and she is spearheading the foundation's mission of bringing improved healthcare to socially and economically disadvantaged public populations. And lastly, we are most fortunate to have Lillian on our board of directors. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Thank you, Jamie. Um, thank you, Pete. Uh, Rich and Norbert for giving those terrific lectures um, with, filled with scientific insights and also uh, personal comments about John. It was so much fun listening to Pete. I actually forgot what I'm going to say, so I have a <laughs> cheat sheet here. Um, anyway, uh, Pete, thank you and the uh, Scripps team for putting together this memorial lecture series uh, in honor of uh, of memory of our own John C. Martin. Um, it's really nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience today, especially the ones from uh, out of town. And of course, I forgot to say uh, thank you uh, for the donor um, with your generous support. Uh, several of you are in the audience. Thank you. Um, so also, uh, I hear that there are more than 100 folks online, so welcome to all of you. You know, John never was one who um, wanted attention on himself, but he uh, really enjoyed getting um, friends and colleagues together, old one, new ones, to have an opportunity to discuss science, research, medicine, public health. Uh, he would have really enjoyed this program today, including the reception that will happen in about seven minutes or so. <laughs> so in my observation, John um, um, 
you know, his, his favorite hobby is actually thinking. His mind would never stop, whether it's about innovative science, um, engineering a project, mapping out different scenarios to forge paths forward to advance patient care. His mind would never turn off. Day and night, he would study new information, simulate, and then um, rehearse the different scenarios over and over again. For those of you who've been in meetings with him, know that he's always so well prepared. Uh, every meeting, every interview and gathering, um, he's always multiple steps ahead of everyone. And uh, he paid great deal of attention to everything, all the details, including the people in the room. So I see knots. I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. So um, today, I just wanted to make a few comments about John's um, you know, professional life. So as a scientist, what mattered to him most was you've got to make a difference. Right, Swami? At the end of the day, you have to make a difference. So he would say, um, you should ask yourself every morning, what can I work on today to make an impact? As a leader, to make good things happen, he championed uh, working internally and externally in a collaborative manner. Um, to him, trust was very important. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the late Secretary of State George Shultz made coins uh, to commemorate his own 100th birthday. And John received such a coin. He really likes the coin. On the coin, the quote says, trust is the coin of the realm. Think about it. Trust is the coin of the realm. If you have trust between your collaborators, you can make good things happen anywhere in the world. And um, so John certainly had trust between uh, all of the collaborators that he had internally and externally. I think this allowed uh, the folks who worked together with him to buckle in and just go for it. As Tai Yan would say, we work at the speed of trust, right? Together, uh, John and his many colleagues were able to achieve remarkable feats in breakneck speed over and over again. And finally, as a pharmaceutical executive, he was always for the patients. Um, he would say, even one day in delay in getting your product approved means patients have to wait one more day uh, to get the prescription filled. And several, uh, um, Pete already mentioned, uh, in 2003 when he uh, visited uh, Sub-Saharan Africa with a bunch of pharmaceutical uh, executives led by uh, the Secretary, no, the Secretary of Human Health Services then was Tommy Thompson. He came back and he said, because of the economic um, diversity and the devastation that HIV AIDS brought to Africa, and he just said, there's no way that we're going to charge everybody in the world the same for this life-saving medicine. So, <laughs> If you've ever been inspired by John to do things a little bit differently, to think about things a little bit differently, you have some of his spirit in you. Um, it's a gift, it's very precious to us. Uh, it's up to us to do, to make something of it, right? So with that, I'm going to stop talking now and share a few photos of uh, some of the audience or uh, the attendees. Um, now we can start the slide. Thank you. I hope you recognize each other.
Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Thank you for the gift. Uh, <clears throat> so we appreciate your leadership in organizing this inaugural lecture. And we also thank the many benefactors uh, who rallied to endow this very fitting tribute to John's legacy. We hope and anticipate that this is going to become one of the vital activities in the academic calendar here at Scripps. And it's really a truly a great way to honor John. Finally, thank you all for coming. We do have a reception out in the plaza, and I'd like to thank all the speakers and uh, for especially for the comms team for putting this all together for a terrific inaugural event. So thank you all. Enjoy the day.